presented by Ridley. Now and not yet. Hi, welcome to a new season and a new episode of the Now and the Not Yet. The show that keeps you plugged into theology and the Bible. I'm Mike Bird. And I'm Scott Harrower. Michael, have you recovered from the chowder we had together in San Diego? Uh, was, it, was it San Diego? Was it Denver, Colorado? Well, I clearly haven't recovered, have I? No, you haven't. But we had a good time. We even shared a room together. We were conference bunk buddies. We were conference bunk buddies. Uh, what are your top three things you remember about sharing a room together? Uh, I remember every time I came back to the room, you were asleep. Well, I need to admit that my top one thing about uh, sharing a room with you was pretending to be asleep so I could listen to your personal phone calls. <laughs> Typical Scott. Uh, no, but you're always up bright and early, uh, ready to go for breakfast and everything. So that was pretty good. But yeah, it was a nice city. I went for a bit of hiking in Denver and okay. that was pretty good too. But uh, Scott, here we are, ready to start a new season. We have a new episode and uh, today's topic, we're kicking off with something that's you know very important, somewhat sensitive as well, and that's the topic of mental health. So uh, this is something you have a bit of expertise in, Scott, because you've you've got a bit of a medical background as mm-hmm. well. You've you've worked at, you've worked as a nurse. I yep. mean, and you've you're now into the topic of theology and trauma, yep. and you know uh, how we have spiritual flush, flourishing even when we have you know various issues and challenges going on, going on in our lives. So, Scott, I mean, what, what's one thing you wish everyone knew about mental health? I think one thing I wish we all knew about mental health was. Uh, the fact that we can flourish, we can be well. Um, so it is possible for us to have healthy biology, healthy psychology and a healthy social life coming out of that. So I think um, here in Australia sometimes we're a bit defeatist about what might be our future if we have been diagnosed with alternate mental states or mental health distress. So I think one thing that we're wanting to do here at Ridley College with a grad dip of mental health and the subjects that we teach is promote good mental health and um, wellness for people, flourishing. And most people at some point in their lives are going to have some mental health challenges. That's right. So we've got some stats here from the Australian Bureau of Statistics which says that over two in five Aussies aged 18 to 65 are going to suffer from mental health distress at some period in their lives. And interesting, Mike, is that for those who suffer mental health distress – over half are going to suffer from 12-month conditions. So people are going to be unwell for over 12 months with that diagnosis. And what's tricky is when you're unwell psychologically, that's going to spill over into relationships, Mm -hmm. into your workplace, into your ability uh, to maintain friendships and so forth. So it's a really rough time. Um, And here in Australia, since we've had COVID, things have got worse. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I survived COVID fairly well as a, um extreme introvert. I kind of cope reasonably well with being locked up in small confined space with nothing but my <laughs> thoughts to entertain myself. Uh, but for other family members in my house, I can tell you uh, the first two weeks for a novelty – After that, it was kind of distressing. Mm. Uh, As much as you love your own family, uh, being locked in a confined space with them for long periods of time was bad. And then you got all the things you can't do, the things you worry about, you get anxiety about. It was a distressing and and you could argue that the whole country, I mean, particularly here in Melbourne, you know, one of the most locked down cities in the world, uh, we had huge COVID distress and that's going to last for the whole generation. Yeah. Uh, of people for the rest of their lives. Mm. So, uh, you know, what do you what if you if you had to say to a pastor, look, there are th- there are here's two things you need to know about mental health, or just to people in churches, what's the top two things you would want people to know about mental health? I mean, not not just the fact that it's so <clears throat> widespread. Uh, what would you say to Christians? Here's what you need to know about mental health. Well, I think the first thing is that you know is a definition. And then the second thing would be an approach. Yep. So firstly, a definition of mental health has to do with well-being in terms of how our biology, psychology and sociology is is working. So it's a functional definition. It's also to do with having um, feelings uh, 
that are positive feelings and not being overwhelmed by negative feelings and looking back on our lives and our futures with distress. When we're healthy also has to do with being able to engage positively with others, to find meaningful work and to feel like we're accomplishing what we set out to accomplish. So there's lots of factors in mental health. I think it's important to recognize those. It's not just one factor. But I believe that the most important thing, Mike, is that we take what I call a TBPS approach, theological, bio, psycho, social approach. Okay. So um, that means for us as um, Christian workers, uh, one of the first things we need to do is to make sure that people are getting good psychiatric help yep. to assess the biological, psychological, some counselling to help us with talk therapy, with some skills, because a lot of mental health is about skills, how we process the world, yeah. how we are resilient and so forth, and then community groups in terms of the social, but then it needs to be framed in a theological way. Um, so it's a TBPS approach, theological, biopsychosocial approach. That's what I recommend. Okay, well, that's good to know about. That's a little bit more than just, you know, pray more, read the Bible more and listen to 1980s Amy Grant. Yeah, sure, you know, sure, some of the, sure. Some of the real sort of low-key, um, you know, uh, counselling things you can get. Uh, I mean, you, you've mentioned that we need a theological framework, but there's also a thing about spirituality. And, you know, there's been a great many Christians, um, you know, throughout the centuries who have been great Christian leaders, either in like theology, ministry or missions, but many of them have had lifelong mental health challenges. Exactly. So uh, Luther, for example. Luther is one. Um, I mean, is, is there a spirituality of mental health? Is there, is, there, is there an influx? Because we often might think that any illness is because there's something wrong with me, something bad, something deficient, some, something sinful about me, where you know, mental health can just be part of the, 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 the course of our lives and, and how we interact with the world. What do, we, what do we need to know or understand about spirituality and mental health? Well, I think one of the big things to know is that, that we're made in God's image and that means that we're made for God's presence within. We're made for flourishing relationally, functionally, morally and in terms of understanding the world. And when there is a situation or social structure that's impeding that flourishing, it's very painful for human beings because that's how we're wired up. So a spiritual understanding of the person helps us understand our breadth, which then in turn helps us understand why it's so painful when we're experiencing alternate mental states, which mean that we can't relate to others in a way that we might otherwise. We can't carry out those things that we might otherwise. We don't understand and perceive in ways that we might otherwise. Or we may feel entirely distant from God and therefore our faith just drops away. So mental health has tremendous impacts on people and I'm really huge, Mike, on the fact that we need to understand the work of God, the Trinity, with us as a tremendous resource. And I'll just give you one example. Great. Jesus is God the Son incarnate. He is a living human being and he is a person just like you and I, but is he is the one trustworthy person that there is. He calls himself our friend as well as being our Lord. So in Jesus we have a trustworthy friend and I think it's key for us that in, in the valley of darkness we are encouraged by others when we can't do it mm. ourselves and when we can do it ourselves to a certain degree to actually reach out to Jesus as a friend and have lots of reminders in our lives of his friendship. Could, could you add to that the Holy Spirit as our comforter, as oh, our absolutely, paraclete, our absolutely. There's ton, tons of things. I was just mentioning one yep. and centrally Jesus, our friend, is, is important. Obviously um, the Spirit and then the community of the Spirit too. I just think sometimes we feel like when we are unwell, the Christian faith has very little to offer. But I want to say that interpersonally, God himself, particularly God incarnate in Christ, has a lot to offer us as a deep friend and Lord in the midst of mental distress. And the Lordship part's important. Yeah. He's not just our friend who can't do anything about it. He's actually the Lord of history, which means we're going to see him at the end face to face yep. in heaven. But he also has the power 
to shape history even when we're unwell. And I think that that's the best kind of friend we could have, Mike. Well, for people who have their own dark night of the soul or feel like they're in the slow of despond, anything from anxiety, I mean, that's, that's, that's good to know that, you know, it's, it's, it's normal, it's part of life. There's nothing to feel guilty about. And there is, there is help. There's good Christian counsel out there if you seek it. So, great. Yeah. Well, thanks, thanks, Scott. That was great. No worries. Thanks, Mike. Hi, friends. Hope you're enjoying the show. And if you are enjoying it, hit that subscribe button. And don't forget to share with your friends if you think they'll enjoy it too. And especially, leave a comment or question. We'd love to hear from you. Scott, many people can experience dark times in their life. I mean, it's not just, you know, mental health. Uh, there's trauma. There's, you know, things that, you know, happen to them, happen around them, yep. which raises the question of evil. And when people think of evil, you can think of, like, you know, supernatural evil, um, personal evil, spiritual evil. Mm. And when you get on this topic, sooner or later, you're going to deal with the topic of Satan. And uh, I, I was once interviewed um, by someone who asked me very, very mockingly, mm. did I believe in Satan? I said, right. do, do you believe in Satan? And my answer to that was, uh, yes, of course. I've been to America, you know, <laughs> where he has his throne. So, of course, I believe in evil. I've been to the great Satan itself. You've been to Babylon. I've been to, I've been to Babylon, man. I've seen, I've seen the heart of darkness. Uh, but, but more seriously, um, you know, what, what, do we, what do we make of, of, of something, a, a topic like Satan? Is this just sort of, you know, uh, a mythology? You've got to, you've got to have a, a villain in the story. You know, uh, you know, in in I mean, in, you know, in, in the Bible, you know, we talk about how um, Satan kind of evolves from this sort of you know angelic creature to a tempter, uh, and is then pitted against God and Jesus. And you, you know, you can see in in different literature in the Hebrew Bible and and the New Testament, and uh, Satan becomes the sum of all human and supernatural evil that there is. We're, um. So do you mean what do you mean when you say he evolves and he becomes the sum of evil? Oh, well, you can see how that you get more and more information uh, coming across uh, the Bible, ranging from the book of Job where, you know, Satan wants to go and test mm. um, Satan. I mean, Satan really means, you know, the, the, the tester or the tempter. Uh, but then in subsequent literature he takes on an increasingly um, more active role uh, in the presence of evil behind this world. Yeah. Okay. And so that's that's what I mean by a kind of you know evolution of the character. You, you, you call this like progressive revelation. Yeah. You get yeah. more and more. So what you get in Job is very is different, or it's sort of developed further from what you say you get in the in the Book of Revelation, where the Roman Empire, uh, its idolatries, its violence, is at one level a manifestation of human evil, but behind the scenes there is something far darker. Mm, mm, mm. So uh, in, in, theology, in theology, you know, what are some different approaches to Satan understanding that whole realm? Well, I mean, one of the principal ones is, as you said, taking Satan very seriously as a personal agent mm -hmm. made by God. So he's, he's a creature, yep. yet he is outrageously powerful. So he is a immaterial, spiritual being with an intellect and a will and the ability to shape actions in the world. And he can do that directly and indirectly. Yep. So he's not to be trifled with and he's incredibly powerful. And one way to understand the story of human beings is to understand us as actually caught up in a much grander cosmic war between God and Satan. Mm -hmm. So Yes, we understand that, that Jesus only takes on a human nature, so he affirms how important we are, we're saved by God and so forth. But the whole reason why it's all a, a difficult time right now is that there are these dark powers at war with God and we are these poor little humans caught up in this larger conflict. And what I like about that approach, Mike, is that it keeps the spiritual on the table. Yep. So, but does that lend itself, though, to a type of, you know, Frank Peretti, this present darkness where there's like, you know, demons, you know, behind the pot plant 
And, you know, and like our prayers are like the artillery that God needs to blow apart the <laughs> demons. And if we're not praying, then God can't defeat the demons because we're not praying enough. I think where I'm taking my cues from is um, first to third century Christians, basically, oh, yeah. who, so Clement of Alexandria, for example, they never lost sight of the fact that we live in a realm uh, replete with angels, archangels, Satan. And if you want to understand history, and the way that we're constituted as people and why we behave in the ways we do, you do need to take the demonic into account together with the work of the Holy Spirit, of course. And it just gives us a way of explaining the otherwise unexplainable, why yep. terrible things happen, surprising things happen. Um, I think if we've got a strong understanding of the devil, Yep. then we won't be blaming God for things that he would never do. Yep. I mean, one of the most powerful things I've ever read on theodicy was to do with um, walking through devastation. When you see people that have died like in a tsunami, yep. it's to remember you're not looking at the face of God, right? Yep. You're looking at the face of God's enemy. That was really helpful for me in terms of understanding uh, theodicy and how God is related to evil. So I think we we really need to hold on to what the Bible teaches us about the devil being a personal agent who is essentially anti-God yep. and he has very powerful will of his own and he is involved in in our history. Yeah. I like everything you said, Scott. I, I think there is the contest between God and Satan. The only thing I want to emphasize is Satan is not in God's league. Okay, so he's not an equal rival. So, 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 it's, so it's, it's not a type of dualism. This really is a type of um, uh, mosquito or, or, or a horsefly or something like that that can be, you know, annoying and buzzing. But ultimately, God is not threatened by this. And this um, menacing creature, you know, we don't usually call it a fly or a scorpion, whatever analogy you like, um, is living on borrowed time. Okay, because yeah. the, the story has been written, the ending has been told, and all evil is defeated, destroyed, and replaced with God's shalom, God's peace. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree. So I'd like to talk about two books that sort of exemplify a couple of different approaches, right? Okay. So we've got Against the Darkness by Graham Cole, former principal of Ridley College. Big fan of the man. Big fan of the man. Um so his approach is similar to yours. It's a biblical theology of observing um, who the devil is, what he's like throughout the Bible. And what Graham is great at is that he selectively dives into issues um, as they're relevant and they're important and he doesn't get lost in, in non-important debate. So, for example, he will... Um, do his biblical theology on angelic beings and then he'll do a little theological dive where appropriate on what does it mean to be a spirit? What what does that refer to? Yeah. So he knows how to pick his theological themes for exploration. That's what I like about Graham, but he never gets distracted from biblical revelation at the centre. Okay. So I highly commend this and I use this in my courses. A different view is Michael Heiser's. He has this book, Demons. Now, I'll ask you for your take in a second, but mine is it's a bit of a Bible code. So it's like he knows all this stuff about um, background beliefs in um, the area where Israel was to do with watches and the, the fallen spirits of dead giants related to the Nephilim and that's where demons come from. And it's like unless you know the archaeological background he knows, you can't really unlock the Bible. So it felt like a Bible code to me. So yeah. I found this book a bit confusing, but I, I want to hear your take. I think Heiser is very big on the, on the ancient Near Eastern background of yes. the Bible. Yes. So he wants to talk about things ranging from uh, the Kittim in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, you know Belia, so that language, the way you have evil spirits also in Mesopotamia and Babylon yeah, yeah. and how that's part of the world of the ancient Israelites but, of course, develops its own story. Uh, as God reveals himself to uh, the Israelites through, you know, the law and the prophets and everything. So, yeah, I, I would argue that Heiser is providing the raw materials that eventually become part of the biblical theology that Cole is doing. Well, but, but let me push back a bit. So, for example, he has this one idea that there are these evil spirits who come down and they basically teach humans how to develop technologies like weapons so that we may go... Elon Musk. 
it suddenly makes sense. <laughs> yeah. I bet if you add up the numbers of his name, it's 666. Right. That makes so much fun. T-E-S-L-A-S. No, Tesla's only got five letters. Okay, anyway. Um, okay, I'm with, you. So, I'm with you. So, for example, he says we, we need to understand that really it's the demonic that are behind uh, humans developing technologies of war once they're outside the garden and um, that helps us to understand why people are sinful against each other. Now, that's not in the Bible. Yep. And it seems to me that in the Bible we're the ones that develop technologies of war and that's part of human sin and and there may be demonic influences in the background but I wouldn't when I'm teaching theology I wouldn't want to want to forefront the demonic and not actually take into account that no it's actually human cultures de- like Lamech for example developing war and boasting in war and becoming violent like we're involved in that I'm not sure that putting an emphasis on demons teaching us that is what the Bible's teaching Okay. That, that's my basic question. Well, I guess it's just one of the different discourses between how you deal with it at the level of uh, the history of cultures and the ancient Near East and thinking about it at a systematics level. But there we go. Satan in the Bible, in the world, lot to think about, lot to consider. So, Michael, I've been on holidays and, as you know, I like reading magazines. And I came across this Lego magazine and it had this bloke on the cover that reminded me of you. Well, obviously. I mean, I've always said I'm not James Bond, but no one's ever seen us in the same room together. Very dapper and he gets things done, my friend. Do you think, um, as we think about Christian leadership these days, do you think James Bond is a good model for Christian leadership? No, I don't. Um, <laughs> surprise, surprise. No, um, uh, horrible womanizer, um, brutal killer, mm. uh, and always kills people with some sort of, you know, funny quip. Like, mm. you know, a guy gets electrocuted and he goes, oh, shocking. Shocking. Something, <laughs> something like that. Exactly. Um, yeah, so no, I don't think James James Bond is a, is a good role model. Um, but good, good role models and leadership can be hard to find because all leaders ultimately are fallible people. And I tend to focus on what makes a bad leader. Mm. You know, and what makes a bad leader? Uh, I think, I think a, a number of, of things. Um, it comes down to personality, competence. I tell you, one of the best metrics for leaders is how they give criticism and how they receive criticism. Right. Uh, because if they're very, very defensive when they receive criticism, that I think betrays a lot of insecurities mm. and an unwillingness to learn and to be self-critical and reflect. And often when they give criticism, they can do it in the most condescending, demeaning yes. way because yes. they don't want to correct, they want to put you down. Yes. And that makes them feel better. Can I mention a related one, which I find helpful, is whether a leader celebrates the success of others. Yes. Because it, it takes someone secure and godly and loving to celebrate someone else's success. And that's that's biblical because one of the things about, you remember Solomon, mm. he didn't like it when they, uh, not Solomon, sorry, Saul. Saul, yeah, Saul. Saul said, David, Saul has killed his thousands and so, uh, Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens, tens of thousands. Tens of thousands, yeah. And Saul did not like that. He was jealous. He, he was jealous. Yeah. And I think that's important. When people try to get rid of their own staff or support thing because they're too good and they, and they feel threatened by that. And I can say both in the army I have worked for some people who I think were certifiable psychopaths yeah, right. along those lines. Uh, and even in Christian ministry, you can you can come across some people um, who do have uh, a narcissistic tendency, uh, a lack of empathy. And uh, w- one thing I've learned is uh, when success is an idol, bullying become a sacrament. Yeah, that's true. Isn't and it? I think you know, people say, well, long as it's successful, long as the church is growing, lots of things are happening. We don't care about the number of bodies hidden at the back of. You know that, that that they've been thrown off the mm, bus or mm. thrown under the bus. So, so who's a, who's a good model of leadership in the Bible? Like, can can we go from Bible to leadership tips for today? Or uh, I think we, we can a bit. Um, obviously, Jesus got to be okay. pretty close. Uh, the what? Apostle Paul, with qualifications, because I think even Paul was d- did not have the most perfect personality. Sure. Um, but also, th- I, I tend to look to more contemporary examples. I know. Um, 
you know, I, I've worked with some very good principals in the past who yeah. have been good leaders mm -hmm. and some good uh, – probably one of my, my favourite sort of statesman-like leaders is a Southern Baptist by the name of Timothy George. Um, yes. Timothy I think George, he, yeah. he personifies a mixture of scholarship, mm. spirituality and institutional management. Scholarship, spirituality, and institutional management. That's good. I think that's something I think that's something to, to reflect on the qualities of a good Christian leader. One of the things we want to do here in the now and not yet is resource you. And it's one of the things that it seems that people appreciate the most as we resource you with good books. So I'm going to briefly work my way through a pile of books that I've found helpful in terms of dealing with theology and mental health uh, for teaching and also for ministering and recognizing what the issues might be. So Theology for Psychology and Counselling, this is a very helpful book. It's just come out. Um, what's good about this is that the authors understand that God is at work throughout the world. They understand common grace and they also understand the work of the Holy Spirit and that being involved in the work of helping people um, in mental health distress through counselling and psychology and ministry is largely joining in with what God might be doing through his spirit and the faculties of human beings together as they walk towards health. So let me give you a little analogy that I found was really helpful. They spoke about the fact that often in our efforts in counselling and psychology and theology, we feel like we, we may help people take a small step, but that, that's lost. So they speak about, think about your efforts helping people as a little breath that we might see on a winter's morning and that breath is caught up in a larger wind, right? That's how they see our works in psychology, counselling and theology. We contribute our little breath and the larger breath of God, the Holy Spirit, includes that in what God is doing. So as much as anything, this, this book is an encouragement to persevere and to understand how our efforts in the realm of mental health may be included in God's efforts to bring flourishing to people. That's a really good book. Um, this uh, volume by Hathaway and Yahouse, it's um, a book that helps you understand how to bring together the domain of psychology and the domain of theology. So it's a methodological book. If you've got questions about how these two domains of science might work together, this is the book for you. If you've got questions about thriving and flourishing and why is it that we're struggling to thrive and flourish? Well, then there's this excellent book by Justin Barrett and Pamela Estein King. These are teachers of mine. Um, I find their approach is great. They're evolutionary informed psychologists and they basically think that there's a gap between the way we're wired up and the way we live and that's why we're not flourishing. So for example, each of us, Mike, have got a special part of our brain that's designed to remember information about people. So we've known each other for a while and I can remember things uh, you've said about your family, your kids, your likes and dislikes, yeah? yeah? But I can only do that for 250 people. Once I'm beyond that, it's actually stressful for me to relate to people. So the question that these psychologists ask is, if our brains are wired up to live one way, but we live in cities where we meet 4,000 people a year and that's stressful, what do we do about it? And the big question is, do you try to adapt to a world that you're not used to or not designed to live in, or is there another way? And I'd like to suggest that there's another way. There's a History of Madness book which is very helpful and it helps you understand some of the biases that might have been built into how we understand mental health and mental distress and alternate states of life. This, this is a hard book to read because it goes through the history of medicine, a lot of hard things that have happened, but if you want to be informed in terms of the history of psychology itself and medicine to do with mental health, very helpful book. The final one I'd like to recommend, which I think is the most relevant to this whole domain and our participation in it, Mike, is um, Working with Spiritual Struggles in Psychotherapy. And this is a book by X-Line and Pergament where they talk about the fact that when Christians suffer, we suffer biologically, psychologically and socially. But when we have mental health distress, we have an additional layer. Mm. That's the spiritual layer. 
we have spiritual religious struggles to do with, with where is God in this situation? Um, why isn't God apparently caring? We have issues to do with the demonic. Is, am I being afflicted by demons here? Is there a moral aspect? Did, did I bring this on myself? And these are all questions that non-believers simply won't have. So the big argument is that we need Christian counselling. They're not Christians because you need to be able to unpack your religious struggles with people that understand your religious insights. So they actually make a great case for the need for Christian counselling in the midst of mental health crises. It's a unique book that addresses why it's so difficult to suffer as a Christian. Excellent resources, Mike. Yeah. Well, my one book I want to recommend is by Zachary Wegner called Non-Toxic Masculinity. We've heard a lot about toxic masculinity. Um, Zach does a great um, rundown on why toxic masculinity is a problem and how to be better men. Uh, how do we have a post-patriarchal manhood? Great book, thoroughly recommended. Well, Scott, that's the end of episode one. We've covered a lot. We've talked about mental health, the demonic. Uh, we've even covered leadership and checked out a few good books. We have. Well, if you enjoyed that, we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Now and The Not Yet. <laughs>